Welcome to Real Christianity. Today, I'm going to be sharing another one of my sermons. We had such great feedback uh, from everybody about my last sermon uh, from church, and I thought I would share another one. We are planning to put a podcast together of all of my sermons, and so that's something that is coming in the near future. Uh, but I did a, a, a sermon this last weekend that I thought would be very fitting for the podcast, and then we'll get back to the regular Veronica and Dale program that we usually do. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how to nurture a prayer revival, how to nurture a prayer revival. And of the three core spiritual disciplines, which I would say is reading the Word of God, praising God, and praying, I think praying is often the most neglected of the bunch. And I, I would say that's probably pretty obvious in most of our experiences that prayer is neglected more than worship music, more than the reading of reading of the word. Uh, John Wesley once said, by neglecting prayer, you lose the taste for it. Oh man, you wrong yourself greatly by omitting these mighty moments with God. I don't know a single person who's not interested. I should say, I don't know a single Christian who's not interested in having a better prayer life. This is something that I think all of us want. We don't necessarily know how to do that. Um, but for most believers, we never break into that kind of consistent, powerful, spirit-driven prayer life that we want. We hear about it. We watch movies like The War Room, but we don't actually experience that. And I would say most of our prayers are you know, small. They remain monotonous. They're weak. Um, they're actually boring. I would say a lot of us are bored with our prayer life. We, we say the same things over and over. We, we don't understand how to pray in a way that is uh, dimensional and powerful and, um, and scriptural. And so uh, what does the Bible say about prayer? I'm going to give you guys just a couple verses to prime our discussion today to kind of prepare your heart for prayer, the concept of prayer. So I'll start with Philippians 4, 6. It says, Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So just, I'm not going to teach on these verses, but I'll give you a couple points here. Uh, by everything in prayer. So prayer is something that we can ask God for anything and everything we could be taking to the Lord. And we do so with thanksgiving. So many of us come to prayer to prayer with the Lord that is in a way that we're expecting something from God. We want to ask something from God. The first thing is to come with thanksgiving. Have a posture of, God, I'm so thankful for everything that I have. Even if you're coming in the midst of a diagnosis of a disease or the tragedy of something that happened in your life, being able to go, oh Lord, thank you for the breath that's in my lungs right now. Father, thank you for uh, the, the wellness of the rest of my children. Father, thank you for... Uh, the fact that I've lived as long as I have and the job that I have and that I've never missed a meal, whatever it might be, we are to come to the Lord in thanksgiving. So that's a primer verse. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Okay, so this is implying that uh, the Spirit comes in and assists us in our prayer life and, uh, and I would say is an important element of our prayer life. It is a cooperating with the Spirit in these specific moments. It is a spiritual discipline. And sometimes we don't know what to pray, but the Spirit will come in and assist us in that manner. Uh, the next one is Matthew 6, 5 through 8. This is Jesus kind of discussing how to pray, what it looks like. He says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to the Father, or pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So this is talking about private prayer versus public prayer. And there is an opportunity and a place for both of those things. 
It's not saying that you should only pray in private and you shouldn't pray in public. No, congregational prayer, prayer before church, that's great things, but you need to be having a private prayer life. And it's not about what you say, it's more about the posture of how you say it. And um, it's talking about the Lord knows what you need before you ask. It's more about sincerity. It's more about genuine heart for seeking out the Lord. And so we're going to talk a lot about that. So prayer should be constant. It should be carried out in the spirit. And it's something that needs to be coming from a genuine heart. So these are some basic principles here. So how do you nurture a prayer life? How, How do you invest, you know, build up the appetite for a stronger prayer life? How do you get the biblical solution for prayer revival in your own life? And if you're not interested in this conversation, um, that should be a sure sign of a huge problem in your own spiritual life. This would be something that you're very much interested in. If you go, oh man, this guy's talking about prayer, move on. That is not the correct posture to have. And that is why your prayer life is weak. Okay. um, So what are the reasons that we're not experiencing this prayer revival that we want in our own life. Well, first, we know it's not more time, okay? It's not a lack of time. Uh, John Piper puts a huge blow to that argument. He actually makes this statement. He says, one of the great uses of social media will be to prove that prayerlessness was not because of a lack of time. Man, there's no way you're going to say, oh, I just don't have time, but you're going to be scrolling on Instagram. I I heard a a statement that it's like the average person on Instagram scrolls one mile a week or something like that on on their scroll feed. I mean, this is crazy how much time we spend on social media that we we can't break in and spend some of that time in prayer. So it's not a lack of time. Uh, We know that the solution to a better prayer life is not simply more theological knowledge. That's a part of it, but it's not just theological knowledge. Um, a, a vibrant prayer life is something that happens from the heart, the soul, and the mind, but it's not just, oh, I need to go seek more information about God. That will revive my prayer life. It's part of it, but it's not the whole thing. We know that the solution isn't necessarily um, discipline. You know, it's not that you just need to go do it more often, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discipline myself into a prayer revival. Again, this is part of it, but you can't isolate these elements. We want to just be the, uh, you know, the American thing, you know, we're preaching here in America, but the kind of, I'm just going to do the hard work and get it done and focus on that. That's not the way that we need to be approaching prayer. And so I want to talk about this idea just for a second, because I think a lot of us struggle with, well, you know, I just don't want to pray. And I have people all the time that message me and they go, I, you know, I just don't want to read the scriptures. It's, it's not exciting to me. I don't want to, to pray. It's not something that I'm, I'm eager for in the morning. Um, and I understand I get messages all the time and I've, I've experienced this myself that you go, Oh, I just, I just don't want, I want to read because reading, man, what is reading? It's eating the word of God. It's feeding my hunger. I, I'm getting something deeply out of it, praising the Lord before, uh, the throne and worship. I love that experience, but praying sometimes feels like, Oh, like Lord, I, I'm not as excited as I am about these other two disciplines. You know, what, what's going on here? First, I want to say, don't be shocked that your flesh isn't excited about reading the word or praying. Don't be shocked about this, right? Uh, prayer is a devotion that is driven by the spirit. And we know that the flesh is against the desires of the spirit. The scriptures teach us this, that that while the war has been won and we are sealed and redeemed, that there is a battle going on between our flesh and the spirit of God that's within us. Galatians 5.17 says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. Some translations say are at war with the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. And for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Okay, just think about that. The flesh is the great preventer of prayer. It's the great preventer of prayer and devotion. And while discipline might be um, part of something, part of the process of reviving that, it alone will not help a weak prayer life. Okay, Um, so it's not time. um, It's not knowledge. 
uh, theological knowledge. It's not discipline. If it's not those three things, what, what can we do? How do we revive our prayer life? How do we bring it into balance with our, our reading life and our listening to worship life? How do we bring it into balance with those things? And I would even say, how do we have it supersede those two things? And so um, what I want to do first is I want to define prayer because I think we have a lot of definitions that are floating around. What is prayer? I'm going to define prayer for you and give you a theological definition of prayer that might help you understand what we're actually talking about. So this is from the Westminster Larger Catechism. It actually asks the question and gives the answer to what is prayer? And this is what it says. Uh, Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God in the name of Christ, by the help of the Spirit, with confession of our sins, and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. Okay, I'm going to read that one more time. I want you to grasp this here. Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God in the name of Christ, by the help of his spirit, with confession of our sins, and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. And so I, I, want, to, I want to take this definition and I want to really start my case here that prayer is fueled by two fountains. Okay. Prayer is fueled by two fountains and those are love and need. Okay. And just follow along with me. Those are love and need. And so first our, our prayer life needs to be fueled by our relationship, our loving relationship with Christ. Okay. So first on the love side that we're talking about, our prayer life needs to be fueled by our loving relationship with Christ. I have never met somebody who had a shallow relationship with Christ and a deep discipline of prayer. Okay. I've never met anybody. If you have a shallow relationship with Christ, you will not have a deep discipline of prayer. So the first part is you have to focus on nurturing this relationship with Christ. And the best way to understand God more effectively and more relationally is to understand God's word more effectively and more relationally. Okay, we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and that scripture is the agent by which God uses to reveal himself to us. The reason we know about God is through scripture. For us that living, you know, not at the time of Christ, The reason that we know of God and the gospel is because of scripture. So I want to give you an analogy of this relational journey with scripture and how you build that relationship there. Um, The reading of scripture in my experience is kind of like uh, walking through a museum. It's it's understanding God is kind of like, or understanding the, the Bible is like entering into a museum. And the first time you're there, Um, You kind of walk around and it's interesting and you're looking at the different exhibits, but you don't really understand the curated theme or, or the deep, uh, you know, background information behind what's going on. Um, But after, after visiting several times, you start to begin to understand uh, the purpose of the exhibit and it, and it increases your appreciation for what's happening in the museum. You start kind of putting things together of like, oh, this I understand what's going on here and how that connects with that section over there. See, but unlike uh, the earthly museums that we might go to, uh, the museum of scripture goes beyond appreciation. It goes goes further than just our appreciation of these matters. um, Because at some point, you're going to realize that the whole museum and that every single exhibit in there is not centrally about history. It's not centrally about geography. It's not necessarily about theology or morality or even the church. It's actually a story about God and you. And when that hits, when that hits in your heart, um, y- you begin to comprehend that the grace exhibit, it's, it's not just about the idea of grace. It's not just even about the church. It's about you. And you begin to realize that the forgiveness exhibit, um, it's, it's not just about forgiveness. It's about you. And you you look at the love exhibit 
and you look at the love story and you realize that the love story is your story. And all of this starts to flood in and just overwhelm you. And and when that happens through the relationship of Scripture to understanding who God is, the relationship with your Lord, it sends you to your knees. It sends you to your knees because you're no longer ignorant of the beauty of what the Lord has done for you and what he's doing for you. And your desires and confessions and acknowledgement flow out of this posture of love for the Lord. And so when you understand God more, it allows us to, to, to more effectively love God more. And so this is, this is the first fountain. I guess if I'm looking over here in the video here, you're, this is the first fountain. And, and we have another fountain right here, right? So the, the, the first fountain is the love for God. The second fountain is need, okay? Need. I want you to pay attention to what this means here. While love is driven by relationship, Need is driven by perspective. Love is driven by relationship. Need is driven by perspective. And a great theologian once said, prayerlessness or prayer is helplessness plus faith. Prayer is helplessness plus faith. Okay, let me illustrate what I think this theologian is saying here. I want to look at Luke. And Luke is talking about uh the story that Jesus is talking and he's giving a parable about the tax collector who's coming to pray and the Pharisee. And you're going to understand the difference between these two people and their perspective of their need. It says also, this is Luke 18, 9 through 14. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Verse 10, he starts the, the, the parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as even raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast. Beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, the Pharisee. For example, or for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. One man had an inaccurate perspective on himself. The other man had an accurate perspective of himself. Okay? One man was blind to his need. The other man was aware of his need. Okay, passionate result or a passionate prayer is the result of humans having an accurate perspective of themselves. We have a tendency to exalt ourselves, okay, and to reduce our need for for God. Okay, he becomes our genie and our therapist that we bring our our needs to and we can cast our demands and desires at his feet. That, 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 That is what he becomes for many people. Okay, this is an incredibly prideful posture to have before the Lord. Okay, brother or sister, you are far more gross than you realize. You're far more gross than you realize. And I'm going to give you an example to make you recognize how fallen you really are. Okay, what's the first and greatest commandment? Hopefully you guys know this. I'm going to recite it for you. But if I ask my daughter, Aria, who is sitting right here, I'd say, hey, Aria, what's the first and greatest commandment? She'd say, oh, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever for one second, for one second in your your life, loved the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind? 
Have you ever for one second loved your neighbor as much as you love yourself? No. No, you haven't. You have not done that. We can't even keep the first commandment, the first and second commandments. That's how broken we are. That's how entrenched we are in our sin. We, we, we must have this recognition, this deep perspective of our need for Christ. The gospel is not just for the lost, it's for the saved. This is why we, we do communion. We, we, we remind ourselves of what happened on the cross. This is why we preach the gospel to ourselves often. Because it's easy to forget we are factories of self-love, of self-exaltation. We must remember our perspective that I can't even keep the first commandment, Jesus. Father, I am here at my feet, a sinner, Father, broken in need of you. Okay, we, we pray from a place of entitlement and it's terribly misguided. It's terribly misguided. And the moment that we forget our need, our perspective of where we are in this story, and the grace that's been given to us, we lose our gratitude, we lose our posture, we lose our, 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 our heart, our incredible and immense understanding of the gospel. We become entitled, we demand. A man aware of his deep need for Christ is a man who has deep prayer. So you, you have this man who has a deep need for Christ. He understands his posture on that totem pole. He is a deep man of prayer. Alistair Begg once said, prayer is an acknowledgement that our need of God's help is not partial, but total. It's not partial, but total. And so as I promised, um, you guys might be thinking, okay, all right, so we have these two fountains, right? We have love and we have need. Understanding God, understanding that museum, and then on the other side is keeping the perspective is that I'm broken and in need of the Lord. Those fountains fuel prayer. But what about the practical tips, right? What about the basic stuff? What about the things that I can just, I, I can start easily cultivating my journey? Um, you know, how do we break through this monotonous prayer life? How do we get back into a passionate prayer uh, devotion time? How do we add more dimension into our prayer? Uh, so I'm going to give you three quick tips, and I'm going to close the story, and then we'll be done. So three quick tips um, on this, this matter. Uh, the first is read the prayers of great saints. I read a little book, and I wish I had it with me right here, called The Valley of Vision. It's uh, daily prayers uh, from the Puritans. There's another one by Lexham Press called Piercing Heaven. Um, and there's, there's, there's several others that you can look for, but the Valley of Vision and Piercing Heaven, these give you the vision of where you want your prayer life to be. And uh, they're not perfect, they're fallen men, but these are beautiful, mature, fervent prayers that are fueled by both love and need and you get to see them and read them. It gives you something to grasp mentally and understand and, and really add dimension to your prayer life. So that's one thing. Um, the second tip I'm going to give you is organize your prayers. This is something that has helped me over the years. Is um, There's really five categories that you can have and you can fit all your prayers into these categories. Um, you have your needs. And these are your spiritual and physical needs. This is also your need for confession, forgiveness, um, wisdom, ailments, whatever it is. So the first one is your needs. Um, and you can kind of go over those things. The second thing, and I would say this is chronological, uh, is family. So the needs and desires of your family, uh, their spiritual needs, their physical needs, spouse, children, parents, siblings, direct family. Then you have uh, your friends and you have the needs and desires for the saved and the lost. So you have your needs, family's needs, friends' needs, and then you have the church's needs. So your local church, right? This is your pastor. If you're not praying for your pastor on a regular basis, please, please, you cannot read the epistles of Paul and not recognize his constant call for them to pray for him. So please pray for your pastor. Um, praying for the unity of the church, the fruitfulness of your gathering, 
uh, the regional area of your church, the global church, the persecuted church, all this, important, important stuff. And the last thing you should be praying for is God's mission on earth, right? So general and specific ministry needs, the Great Commission, um, the government leaders, the poor, all, all these things go into these categories. So you have these five categories, your needs, family, friends, church, and then God's mission. So that's, a, that's my second point of kind of practical. Um, the third is just to pray scripture back to God. Pray scripture back to God. This is a really simple tip. Uh, that's really helped me break through in seasons to deeper prayer. And um, what I mean by that is, well, first, let me explain. The Bible's theology of prayer, if you want to look up a biblical theology of prayer, meaning that what does the Bible say about prayer? Um, prayer is inaugurated in Genesis chapter 4. It's the first time you actually see the idea that, uh, that men began to call upon the name of the Lord. And the call that they were calling upon is they're calling for God to come through and fulfill his promises. And so you, you can't ask God to fulfill his promises in scripture if you don't know what they are. And so that's one thing is that the purpose of prayer is to call God to fulfill and to come, come through on his promises. And so one way that I've been able to do this that's helped me, and I learned this from uh, Dr. Donald Whitney at Southern Seminary. He actually has a good video on this of praying prayer uh, or of, uh, sorry, of praying scripture back to God is open up the Psalms. Okay, open up the Psalms and uh, you can just start using the Psalms as a prompt to understand uh, prayer and, and to give you ideas and further motivation and momentum in your prayers. You don't need to make it robotic. You can still have it spirit led. You can still start off your, your, your prayer however you want, but you have the Psalms there to keep you going deeper and deeper and deeper into prayer. And I'm going to just give a, a good example. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Whitney did this as an example, and I thought it was helpful. It's Psalm 23. So I'm going to just imagine you open up Psalm 23 and um, you're in the middle of your prayer and you're thanking God for the things that you have. You're, you're asking God for your specific needs. And you kind of get to this point where you go, oh, I just don't have anything else to say. Um, <clears throat> this is a place where you can exercise prayer. And you, you go the first verse uh, in, in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And you start going, oh Lord, thank you for being my shepherd. Father, to not leave me as a stray, but Father, you have guided me all the way. Lord, you, you take me to places. You, I can trust you, Father. You protect me. You are my shield. Father, you have always cared for me. And I've not wanted anything. I've not wanted food. I have everything that I need, Father. Thank you. And then you move on to verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Oh, Father, thank you for always providing for my needs spiritually and physically. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of the righteous for his namesake. I mean, you can go on and on and it becomes a beautiful prompt. Again, don't make it robotic. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you through that. But that has been a very practical and helpful way to add a dimension of prayer for me. Um, uh, and yeah, and, and just go until you complete the prayer. You don't need to keep going and going and going just, just to fill the room. But you really need to work staying genuine with that, right? Uh, Spurgeon says, true prayer is measured by weight, not by length. Uh, Tozer says, when we become too glib in our prayer, we are most surely talking to ourselves. So uh, we, we've got this wrap-up idea. We know that it's, it's, it's these two elements, right? Love and need. We got some practical tips. I want to close with just a story, a short story, about what I think is the power of prayer that we need to recognize that if the Lord's not in it, man, you're just laboring by yourselves. So I'm going to tell you a story about a guy named D.E. Host. Okay, if you guys know who Hudson Taylor is, D.E. Host is the guy that took over Hudson Taylor's ministry in China after he had been doing that great evangelism work there. Um, and he wrote a book called Behind the Ranges. And he was trying uh, to analyze a problem that he'd been seeing. So he had two villages, right? One village that he lived at and he did his ministry, and he was with these people. And then over the mountain range, there's another village that he would go over periodically and spend some time with. Um, but he learned that the people that he was spending the most time with, um, you know, regardless of how much preaching, um, how much counseling, how much praising, how much church gathering, they were actually not doing quite well. 
he was there, he was investing, but on the other side of the range where he wasn't present, they were always doing great. And so he was confused by the fact that, man, I'm here and I'm investing over here, yet the church spiritually isn't doing well. Yet over here where I'm absent, um, the church is doing really great. What, what's actually happening here between these, these two churches? And um, after seeking the Lord in prayer, he recognized that uh, while he was with the people here doing the preaching and the counseling and the teaching, he was praying less for those people that he was with. And he was, because he was absent, he was praying more for the community that he was not with. And so it came to him to a conclusion. He said, there are four basic elements of making disciples in missionary work. He says, number one is prayer. Number two is prayer. Number three, prayer. And number four, the word of God in that order and about that proportion. And I just thought that was a beautiful story that you go, you can do all you want in your own labors, but until you just invoke the Holy Spirit and the power of Jesus Christ in your prayer, man, you're working on your own. How many of us have just gone raw in our own efforts while neglecting the power of God that could come in and do more in a second than we could in a lifetime? So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to teach on this matter. Lord, I pray that I've been faithful to the text and that we have a better understanding of prayer. Father, we thank you that you've given us an opportunity to communicate with you, Lord, and that you've promised that, that you hear our prayers, Father. We thank you that, that we have an ability to come to you. Lord, we ask for a revival in our hearts. Lord, teach us how to want to want you more, Father. Put that in with us, Father. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.